uh, very good morning and welcome everybody. And thank you for joining in everybody today. Uh, today, we are here for another uh, very interesting webinar episode organized by the, the Society for Health and Research and Innovation Academy, and which is going to be a very interesting topic. Uh, before uh, moving to the uh, topic, I would like to uh, introduce you for some ground, uh, housekeeping rules. Uh, first of all, this webinar link, link will be available only up to 9.50 for you all to join in, and no late attendees will be uh, accepted into the webinar after 9.50. Uh, each attendee should stay till the end of the webinar, for, uh, for you to obtain the certificate for CPD points. And these CPD points are strictly adhered uh, to the NCCPD uh, guidelines. And if you uh, during the, the webinar, if you all have any questions, you can ask in the chat box and all the questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. And during the webinar, I would like all of you to keep the, the mics muted and keep the, the cameras turned off in order to keep this webinar going without any disturbances. Uh, and today's topic is a very interesting topic, uh, which is going to be uh, unlocking the congenital heart diseases in pediatric intensive care units. Uh, for this, today we are joined with, uh, with one of the best person for the respected topic, Dr. Gajilan Sundar Raja, the consultant pediatric intensivist at uh, Pediatric Intensive Care Unit Teaching Hospital on Radhapura. And I hope you all will enjoy. And uh, over to you, sir. Thank you very much for kind in introduction. Good morning, everybody. Uh, today, we are um, looking forward to the interesting topic. Uh, this is map of my presentation. Introduction, Anatomy and Physiology of Heart Disease. This is the shortlisted Anatomy and Physiology, not clarification. And the next, classification of uh, congenital heart disease, not detailly, only for the management purposes. And Frank Sterling Law. And interesting cases, some encountered in PICU and take home message. What is congenital heart disease? It is anatomic malformation of the heart or great vessels, that's iota or pulmonary artery, occurring during intrauterine development, leading to defect in cardiac structure or function, which present at birth, irrespective of age of presentation. This means this cardiac defects from the birth, but child can present in any age of the, their life. Prevalence in worldwide, it is uh, 8 to 12 in 1,000 life birth. And estimated number of children born with a congenital heart disease in Sri Lanka is 3,255 per year. Uh, this, uh, this is last published in uh, 2021 data. And this congenital heart disease normally high uh, end up in stillborn, spontaneous ab abortions, and premature babies. These are the common uh, the, uh, presentation normally congenital heart disease. If the child during the fetal development, if they develop some congenital heart disease, uh, their life is not suitable for the uh, common environment. Yeah, factors associated, normally some factors are associated with congenital heart disease. These are the common factors, fetal and maternal infection in first trimester. Commonly, it is uh, rubella associated with patent ductus arteriosus. And other chromosomal abnormalities, insulin-dependent diabetic mothers, and some teratogens and syndromes. Trisomy, Marfan, Turner syndrome, Moonan syndrome, Williams and Digest, like this. Right. This is the normal cardiac anatomy and physiology. Normally, in the card, there are four chambers, you know, uh, two atria and two ventricles. That in right atrium of the venous return coming, uh, to the right atrium and followed by it is go to the 
right ventricle and from the right ventricle there's a blood supply oxygenation in the lungs and it will return to the left atrium and then go to the left ventricle that purified blood that oxygenated blood supplied to the all over the body via the iota and its branches this is normal circulation and this in the physiological wise that impulses started from the uh, SA knot and it is conducted through fibers, uh, AB knot, and then with the Purkinje's fibers, one cycle is completing. This is the normal anatomy and physiology you all know. For the refreshment, I put this slide. You see the classification. Uh, this is they go to the structures of the card uh, and function. But for the management purpose, this three classification is important. First one is low cardiac output status. That means from the heart, cardiac output is very low. Why this cardiac output is low is maybe due to obstruction or heart can't pump the, uh, pump the blood effectively. That's called obstruct uh, obstructive. Another one is congestive heart failure. That means increased pulmonary blood flow. But with the lesion in the heart, it causes increased pulmonary blood flow. Uh, that's congestive heart failure features. That's asynotic heart disease. And other one is cyanosis physiology. That is de uh, decreased pulmonary blood flow to the lungs. So purified, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, because of decreased pulmonary blood flow means that uh, purif purification of the uh, blood, that means oxygenation of the blood is decreased. So uh, the child or baby will develop the cyanosis physiology. This is only for the uh, management purposes I mentioned that there are a lot of classifications you can see. Right? What are the lesions commonly associated with this uh, physiological condition? That is low cardiac output, normally aortic stenosis, coaptation of iota in right heart pulmonary stenosis. Congest congestive heart failure, that means normally PDA with left to right shunt, ASD, ASD uh, mainly very low level and ventricular septal defect, uh, atria ventricular septal defect and partial anomalous of pulmonary venous drainage. And cyanotic, commonly you know, that is tetralogy of fallot, total anomalous of uh, pulmonary venous return, tungus arteriosus and TGA uh, and trichotrichia and double outlet right ventricle and Hypoplastic left heart syndrome. These are the common congenital heart disease associated with this. These diseases, how they are present? They are present with the common uh, presentation like respiratory tract infection or difficulty in breathing or tachycardia or motor skin. But are the, these are the common presentation with the common disease. But easily can be missed if we if we uh, don't look at in detail. So, other one is during the management of this congenital heart disease, or uh, uh, if the child present with any other disease with underlying congenital heart disease, we have to consider cardiac function with this Frank Starling curve, right? This Frank Starling curve actually developed with the in this curve cardiac output or stroke volume and this uh, x axis for the end diastolic volume this when the end diastolic volume is increasing cardiac output or stroke volume is increasing in a linear manner but at the point it can't increase the cardiac output right but when we are giving more fluid in at this point beyond this point what will happen heart will so statically, cardiac output will be same, but uh, no cardiac output will not improve. So after that, when we are giving, if we are not 
know without knowing this uh, curve if we are give more fluid due in the acute uh, conditions what will happen is that cardiac output ultimately will reduce without knowing giving more fluid right and so this curve is very important during the acute management of this patients, whatever the patient, but underlying uh, cardiac disease is very important. Right. With this background, we will see some cases. Um, these are very challenging cases. For, and uh, through these cases, you can learn a lot of cardiac this is very tiny baby, three month old baby boy, weight five kilogram, previously well, or it's like infection or previous hospital. Uh, Administration of EPL, severe nasal, uh, nasal congestion, and we think for a reduced feeding. On admission, the respiratory rate was 80, increased work of breathing. That means subcostal intercostal resistance and nasal flaring. All the distress features were there in the board, and they had equal burden. So for the disturbance because of network problem. Right. In cardiovascular assessment, heart rate is 180 to 200 per minute. Cardiac monitors of sinus tachycardia and good volume pulses. Dual rhythm, no murmur. Abdomen source, abdominal uh, breathing with palpable liver. Uh, central nervous system wise, child is irritable child. And general examination, child is fallow and afebrile. What is the working diagnosis? Yeah, working diagnosis is common. Bronchiolitis with hypoxia. So, how will you manage according to bronchiolitis management? Nasoprong oxygen, 4 liter per kg with, uh, and nil by mouth with nasal decongestion and uh, hydration with maintenance fluid and continuous monitoring. Yeah. The child was initially improved uh, without any problem and the uh, general condition of the child was improved. But on day six, child worsening of symptoms uh, requested PI subet. Uh, indication was they want to intubate the child because of respiratory distress and excretion of the child. But asked to send to PIC without intubation. On admission to PICU, our assessment is the child is pink and febrile. Uh, respiratory was tachypnea. Uh, respiratory rate around 100 per minute. Respiratory distress. Saturation 85 in air. Bilateral crepitation. Prolonged expiration. Cardiovascular system beats per minute. Not appreciated clear gallop rhythm. Murmur also not clear. Capillary filling 2 second. Blood pressure 70 by 50 with MAP 55. Right. Abdomen. So, so, because of some network problem, I will off my video and I will discuss. Right. Examination child is irritable, pupil size unequal. Uh, and why this uh, unequal people? Do you know anybody? Because this child was managed as bronchiolitis. Nebulized with Ipraven, so Ipraven nebulization can cause under, uh, unequal paper. So, no abnormal posture, no convulsion. Metabolic wise, uh, capital refilling 200, 
and blood gas or some asbestos fields and uh, PaO2 was 160 and PF ratio uh, 92. In sepsis part, no fever, child's on antibiotics. Right. On PACO, what is the working diagnosis? Severe bronchitis complicated with ARDS plus or minus heart failure. So management put into high flow uh, heated humidified high flow nasoprom oxygen with 3 liter per kg with minimal FiO2 but uh, with the FiO2 saturation maintained around 90 source white out lung is compa compatible with the ARDS. The management was continued with the full restriction and pure uh, infusion and monitoring with the vital. Vitals and urinary urine output electrolyte was acceptable range and saturation around 93 to 90, 90 to 93 with FIO to 25. With the stabilization two times echocardiography done by cardiologist in inward 2D echo, it was normal. Baby gradually improved with restriction of fluids and fevers might. So plan to be no from the high flow oxygenation, but reduced to 3 liter to 2 liter. But again, child develop this situation and distress. What to do here? Why this child developed this situation and distress? It's clearly solves uh, some left to right shunt lesion is there. When the flow, high flow flow is when I reduce to low, low site or gradually reduce, the child develops desaturation because with the high flow, I maintain the PEEP in high level. But when I reduced it, that intra um, pulmonary pressure is reduced. So left to right shunt tree occur. So what to do? I reduce gradually with further reduce the fluid and increase the prosomite infusion, right? With this my adjustment, child finally we off to nasal prong oxygen in following three to four days. And after that, proper echocardiography from echo room by cardiologist is so moderate size PDA with severe left to right shot. So after that, child was sent to tertiary hospital in LRH and surgical intervention was done. Now the child is doing well. Right. My second case is, this is seven month old, seven month and 15 days old child with 6.5 kilogram baby with recurrent respiratory tract infection presented to pediatric casualty board with severe respiratory symptoms. This child previously several times, uh, within one month, two episodes like, several episodes of respiratory tract infection, treated recurrent bronchiolitis, and uh, with the treatment, child was improved and discharged, but throughout these seven months, child had daily symptoms. So you know, treated as bronchiolitis, what happened? Giving oxygen and uh, fluid management and nebulization and nasal drops, decongestion. And with these, this every time they manage as bronchiolitis, and uh, this time very severe distress. And while managing as a bronchiolitis in this presentation, also child developed increased severity of respiratory distress and recurrent apneic episodes. Early morning, child went to respiratory arrest and intubated and transferred to PIC. On admission assessment, general assessment, child is intubated, but with the intubation also not sedated, so uh, child saw some gasping breathing and uh, very severe respiratory distress 
soon, soon after admission to PICU, connected to ventilator with full sedation. And uh, cardiovascular system is tachycardia with motile skin uh, with poor volume of pulse. So initially managed with plate. And abdomen saw some uh, little bit enlargement of liver, but not that much high. And uh, central nervous system, child is irritable. And sepsis by child had high spike of fever. This fever was developed after admission to hospital. The child was in hospital for more than 48 hours. What is your working diagnosis here? Bronchopneumonia with bronchospasm with left to right lesion. So management according to this management with fluid restriction, erythromide infusion, and uh, proper antibiotics, and continuous monitor. That's a very important continuous monitor. That with this initial management, child's clinical condition was improved. That means child's heart rate is reduced and work of breathing reduced, and child is continuously managed for 48 hours with full sedation. but child's improved very slowly. So inward echo was done several times because of uh, these uh, several extubation failures and uh, that it shows uh, echo, inward echo was normal. They say to be that, that in inward echo, normally you can't see the full um, structure of the heart or function because of this poor window. That viewing window should be clear for see the structural abnormality or functional abnorm abnormality of the heart. So that in initial assessment, that cardiac member also not there actually in anterior part. But we are not normally we are not checking in the posterior part. This so with the suspicious of left to right shun. With the thorough examination, there's a murmur slowly heard in the posterior part of the neck, let's say the back. So, suspected PDA, but with this further fluid was restricted and uh, successfully child was extubated with this acute management. And after extubation, we did uh, proper echocardiography from the Pediatric cardiologist, it shows moderate size PDA with left to right shunt. So we started to, uh, we continue the management as heart failure. And after that, we sent the child to LRH cardiology unit through our ward. And PDA ligation was done. And after that, some complication occurred in the cardiothoracic ICU LRH and followed it by. Child successfully rated and now child is doing well. This is another interesting case, Three, very challenging case also. Three months and two weeks old baby, weight 4.5 kilo, previously apparently well, presented to pediatric casualty ward with following symptoms. Cough and cold, difficulty in breathing, reduced feeding, and irritability. So, on examination, child's AFI, dehydration, respiratory distress, uh, respiratory rate around 80 per minute, saturation 85 in room air, tachycardia, heart rate 160, capillary refilling. Three second dual rhythm, query murmur, and cardiac monitor sinus tachycardia. Abdomen soft, liver palpable, renal urine output reduced. Metabolic wise, CBS more than 500, during ketone body weighting, mixed acidosis with, with lactate 5. What is the working diagnosis at what? They put some diabetic ketoacidosis, bronchiolitis with sepsis and impending septic shock, 
but acute heart failure precipitated by bronchiolitis in a child with undiagnosed congenital heart disease. What did you think about this differential diagnosis? Because of high blood sugar and this respiratory pattern, they started to read as diabetic ketoacidosis. Right. In our point of view, common thing is common. So we will think at least we will think about that bronchiolitis with sepsis or impending septic shock. But most probably that, uh, the differential diagnosis is acute heart failure precipitated by bronchiolitis in a child with undiagnosed congenital heart disease. So they managed as diabetic ketoacidosis. Initially, they managed as for several, uh, initial several hours, they managed as diabetic ketoacidosis. And after that, lab report during ketone bodies came as negative. So they stopped it. And then they started to manage as bronchiolitis, severe bronchiolitis. Because blood sugar was reduced and tachypnea was not set. So for bronchiolitis management, they was connected to humidified, heated humidified high flow nasopron oxygen two, li uh, two liter per kg and FiO to 60 to 70. With that, throughout the night, child's uh, saturation was maintained by more than 95 percentage. They started salbutamol and infrared nebulization and uh, IV fluid 100 percent maintenance. Throughout that, child's Saturation was 95 to 100. What do you think about the management? Yes. With this management, they happy with the saturation. And early morning, baby ended up in cardiac arrest. Intubated and resuscitated, admitted to PIC. On admission to PIC assessment, fallow, mortal skin, baby intubated, hand ventilating by AMBU, which connected to 50 liter per minute oxygen, saturation 100. Cardiovascular system 180, capillary filling less than uh, more than 5 seconds, brachial pulse difficult to palpate, BP unrecorded. Abdomen distended, liver palpable 4 to 5 centimeter, no urine output last for last 4 hours. So soon after admission to PACU, we connected to ventilator. Because of initial, because of poor pulse, no urine output for last four hours, we tried with 0.9% uh, saline, that is normal saline, 5 ml per kg started, just started. Not at increasing heart rate. So we stopped the bolus and started to give uh, status one milligram per kg furosemide. Heart rate gradually reduced up around 160 like, but color of the child improved, blood pressure recordable, urinary, urinary catheter saw some urine output. Bedside ultrasound scan and echo done. It saws. IVC congested, no movement with respiration, pleural effusion, hyperfunction of the ventricles with distension of the ventricles, query VSD with left to right shunt, empty urinary bladder. So manage with fluid restriction and furosemide infusion. Here, initially with the one milligram per kg, child's saw some uh, improvement. So I in started high infusion rate around 2.5 milligram per kg per hour right and after that uh, proper echo was done with a pediatric cardiologist perimembranous vsd with left to right shunt he said fleet overload is there so more we can increase more frosmine 
infusion. So within two hours of VIC admission, child was stabilized. Heart rate maintained around 120 to 130, MAP around 35 to 40, mean arterial pressure, and acceptable urine output was there. So we continued monitoring. Right. With this monitoring, third hour of PACU admission, not at all T way with cardiac monitor. Why? Yeah, one answer they said hyperkalemia. Yes, hyperkalemia is the reason why this hyperkalemia occurs. With a frusamide, we are expected to hypokalemia. So initially they read it as diabetic ketoacidosis. What is the diabetic ketoacidosis management? With the insulin dextrose, they are starting potassium. So high and this with this above finding with the echocardiography and ultrasound findings or some fleet overload features. So what happened? That same amount of potassium was there, but fluid also overload. So concentration of the potassium is maintained. But after starting furosemide, what happened? Urine output improved. So with the urine output, water loss is small. So when the in the body or intravascular or in our body, when water loss is there, concentration is increased. So, with this, potassium concentration is increased. That's why this child developed not a tall, uh, tall T wave. So, hyperkalemia management was started. What is the hyperkalemia management? Initially, back to back nebulization with salbutamol, and then correction the acidosis with bicarbonate, and then dextrose insulin infusion. Right? So, this child actually with a severe and several problems, we ultimately managed with the hyperkalemia and after that extubated and sent to the ward. This, when this type of patients coming, our learning point is here, we have to manage the common things. When we are unnecessarily giving some drugs or some fluid, it will cause more problem. Here, we successfully managed this heart, heart lesion and this problem. And after that, another problem was happened because of the epidemic uh, issue. So we have to very We have to this tiny babies in a very uh, appropriate manner. That's a very important. Here, learning point is unnecessary potassium no need to give because this and the common with this respiratory distress and fever and these features commonly respiratory problem or cardiologic problem. That is in three month old child, diabetic ketoacidosis is very rare, uh, but previously well child, right? So don't think too much of diagnosis with these tiny babies when they are coming first time. Right. Then other case four, 41 days old term baby, boy, birth weight 2.6 and current weight is 3 kilo, following well baby clinic and uh, because of initial lactation failure, presented to well baby clinic with following symptom with the six weeks review. Cough and cold, one big duration, reduced feeding, and irritable cry. 
admitted to pediatric casualty medical ward in the morning. Started to manage as bronchiolitis with secondary infection. So you know what is the management, oxygen, hydration, and decongestion. Because of secondary infection, they started some antibiotics, IV antibiotics. Because of difficult calculation, central light was inserted by consultant anesthesiologist theater. Right, 5 p.m. requested to PA to bed. My child is respiratory distress. Right. Here, after requested by PA, uh, by uh, casualty ward team, uh, and they said that this child's, because of cannulation problem, CV line inserted by anesthetist. So the child was admitted at around evening, around 6 o'clock, uh, to the PACU with mortal skin and pale skin. With the respiration is gasping, shallow breathing, saturation 50 to 75, with face mask, oxygen 10 liters. Cardiovascular system, heart rate 180 to 200 beats per minute, no palpable pulse, pressure unrecorded. Abdomen, no hepatomegaly, cardiovascular system. No convulsion, people dilated, 4 millimeter non reactive. Metabolic capillary filling, 390. Hepatomegaly, uh, sorry, hematology wise waiting reports. Sepsis, history of fever for one week back, and non admission, hypothermia, 34 degrees Celsius. What do you think with the clinical presentation? With the history and exam. Combination is like a septic shock because of bronchopneumonia plus septic shock. First, because of this tiny baby, he decided to manage as a neonate. So, admitted to PICU and managed as neonate. Right? What is the working diagnosis? Bronchopneumonia with septic shock, right? Plus or minus any underlying heart disease. This is the working diagnosis. In this baby, uh, less than three months or four months, commonly in the infants with the respiratory symptoms, always. Thinking of congenital heart disease is very important. That's why check coding. Before managing these babies, in all babies, all type of babies, you have to have a working diagnosis. Otherwise, it's very difficult to manage in a target point. So when you are managing, you have some target. You have to monitor for whether I am achieving this target or not. So we gave, because of our working diagnosis, pneumonia with septic shock, Initially, blood gas also lactate was around 6. So we gave three boluses, intubate, electively intubate. And before intubation, I called anesthetist. Uh, how would you insert the CV line without intubation? They said uh, the child was sent to board, sent from board. So if they intubate and if the child uh, difficult to extubate, uh, if ICU bed is not available, it's very difficult to manage. So they put LMA and uh, sedated, and after that, they took the CV line. So at that time, they noticed some uh, abnormal breathing, and uh, they, they were told that this child had this symptom continuously. So after admission to PICU, electively intubated and ventilated, started antibiotics, anotropes started, X-ray. This child need actually with the fluid bolus needed more than 40 milliliter per kg fluid. And X-ray was taken and echocardiography arranged. Following the echocardiography, echo was done, right? 
we plan to do urgent echocardiography but uh, we couldn't do it so after that after initial resuscitation we discussed with parents but when we are discussing the, the parents told this child had the symptom of heart failure continuously that means during the feeding child develop sweating excessive sweating and pausing of the feeding and poor uh, weight gain. So after successive resuscitation, note that elevated blood pressure continuously. Why? What are the reasons for Normally, after anotropic, anotropic uh, started, the blood pressure will be high. So we did, uh, we reduced the also source continuous blood pressure high. So reassess the baby. But it is suspicious. You know, high blood pressure in neonates or in infant, common cause is cardiac loss. That is coaptation of iota. So we examined for that. But femoral pulse and other peripheral pulses after successful resuscitation also poorly palpated. So in what echocardiography was done, it's not a significant one. Uh, that, that's it during the weekend. So Monday, pediatric cardiologist did that proper echocardiography. It shows for severe coaptation of five water. So a child's what is the management? Prostoglandin infusion and transfer to LR. Why prostoglandin infusion? Here, the child is six weeks. Why we start a prostoglandin infusion? Because to prevent more coagulation, that the connecting point, PDA connecting point inside the iota is patent. So if we start a prostoglandin there, it will take pattern if the uh, tissue of the PDA in the opening side of iota uh, if shrink, that partition will increase. So to prevent it, we start a PG infusion, prostaglandin infusion, and transfer to LRH. In the midnight, successfully cardiothoracic uh, balloon dilatation was done by a consider cardiologist and the child was handed out to cardiothoracic ICU. Their child was managed and now child is doing well. Right. This case five, this is last case. Three month old preterm baby girl, birth weight 1.8 kilo, current weight is three kilo, postnatally uh, evaluated for cardiac moment, diagnosed to have perimembranous VST and osteum second VST, moderate PDA, on baby clinic and cardiac clinic follow up, presented to pediatric casualty medical ward with uh, in the evening with following symptom. The symptoms are excessive dry and reduced feeding. What is on admission? What is the working diagnosis here with this background history and this um, history present history? Until proven otherwise, this is acute severe heart failure. Right. Examination source irritable, tachypnea, increased work of breathing, respiratory rate 70, saturation 81 air, bilateral crepes and prong expiration, heart rate 160, abdomen, liver not palpable. Here, very important, liver not palpable is very important. Because of liver not palpable, they did the think about that heart failure. So, they managed as bronchiolitis. So what will happen if you manage the bronchiolitis in this child? You are giving oxygen. Oxygen is the pulmonary vasodilator. You are giving fluid. So with the fluid, that electrolytation will be improved. So condition will not improve continuously. So what will what happen? They read it as bronchiolitis is secondary infection. That same management was given early morning. These are happening. In this ward, early morning increased respiratory distress. All the patients, you know, these symptoms are worse in early morning. 
Why? Because of overnight management and overnight not monitor. Early morning increased respiratory distress, respiratory arrest, and cardiac arrest. Resuscitated successfully, intubated, and transferred to PIC. On PIC admission, child was motor skin, respiratory gasping breathing, into, uh, poor lung expansion with ambu ventilation, bilateral AI and equal, bilateral Krebs was noticed with bronchospasm, respiratory around 8, 86, supposed to be intercostal recession. Saturation 100. Cardiovascular system, peripheral pulse plus, low to moderate volume, extremity is cold. Heart rate 192, blood pressure 120 by 83. Abdomen hepatomegaly, reduced urine output. Central nervous system, pupil non reactive, size 4. Sepsis, high spike fever. What is the working diagnosis? Severe acute heart failure plus septic and septic shock with multi-organ failure suspected because of this last urine output four hours not there. That means all other organ star for fluid or star for oxygen. So management started connected to ventilator needed to high PIP. Fluid restriction, furosemide infusion here, spinolactone, tobitamine here, on admission, we started uh, bolus furosemide and after that, we started high dose of infusion. And uh, we added spinal electrode and needed, initially needed some uh, anatrop. Here, considering uh, but dobutamine or dobutamine plus adenaline. This is the confusion. So, because of this uh, problem, I started both. But after the two hours duration, child's vital improved. Invest, investigation based uh, done on admission in the ward, normal, other than uh, hemoglobin was 7. So, blood transfusion is that. Why? Why this is 7? Because of dilution, maybe, and because of chronic disease. Already last three months, child's had VSD, ASD, and several hospital admissions. So, we gave the blood also. Investigation after 36 hours, hospital admission revealed following. Acute hepatic failure, that means liver enzyme was very, very high, around 3000. And acute renal failure, serum creatine and blood urea was very high. And INR was 3.2. So investigation monitored rising trend. It was rising in the Normally, if these features are there with the multi organ features, we are doing them twice per day. So, these investigations all are very rising trend. So, what's the problem? We are starting high dose of uh, fluoride to support the heart and fluid restriction. So, what happening? Organ perfusion is reduced. Organ perfusion is reduced. And this is tiny baby, three month old, only three kilo. So I decided to manage as neonate. So what is the man management? What is the maximum fluid we can give to neonates is 150 ml per kg in normal neonates. So here restriction is 100 ml per kg I restricted. But in normal children, in infant, three month old child, we are restricted to 80 percentage. That means normal child, normally maintenance is 100 percent maintenance. Maintenance that is 100 ml per kg, but in neonates it is 150 ml. If we manage as neonates in this this child, then fluid restriction 100 is more. So we started to uh, increase some fluid to 120, but it is restricted. If we consider this child as neonate, right? IV fluid and furosemide infusion was revised. Increased IV fluid to 120, 100, 120. Initially, I restricted to 70 percentage. And uh, with this adjustment, renal function, liver function improved significantly. Uh, no compromisation occurred in the cardiac or respiratory. And coagulopathy, little bit improved. 
but fever and pro fever was continued and procalcitonin and CR uh, very high procalcitonin, but CRP was normal. Why CRP is normal here? Because of acute liver failure, CRP is produced in liver. So we can't in acute liver failure we can't assess the sepsis or inflammation by CRP. And following several days, we managed with these things. All the things are improved. So I decided to extubate. With after improvement of this renal function, liver function, I restricted the fluid to 100 ml per kg and gradually I reduced to 80. Feeding also tolerating. So I decided to extubate. So several extubation failure. Why? Because fever going on, but that's the focus. All the cultures came as negative, but because of continuous fever, every day, day, day we are doing the cultures, including ET secretions and the blood culture. So ET secretions came as E. coli and as vector positive. So what's the reason? Because well, ventilator associated pneumonia by this child undergoing full sedation and intubated more than five to seven days. So it can occur. So after that, uh, according to sputum culture or ET secretions culture, ABSD, we revised the antibiotic and sedation vacation, antibiotic withdrawal symptom also. So with this anticipating, this management was started. Antibiotic device, sedation vacation for uh, intermittent living of the sedation and secretion set out. And anticipating withdrawal, so we started clonidine also. With that, clinically child's improving. Now child is in vein of process. Still child is in the ICU. Plan to extubate to humidified heated High flow nasal oxygen next week. Yeah. According to this above cases, what is the common take home message? Is, what is the take home message? Important take home message is. Consider common thing first, always. Don't think too much of diagnosis and manage according to that and wait and see the re response. Always wait and see the response. If response is poor, you have to consider another diagnosis. Doesn't show any expected result in the baby, always think why. Why is the good question? You always think about why. And don't hesitate to get opinion from other subspecialty team. Because this uh, in ICU, you can get opinion from others, but decision should be by intensivist. After analyzing all the cases and all the investigation and all the opinion, you can con consider all the opinions or you can't apply all the opinions to the baby. And normally, this is the critical care word our boss always telling sufficient is enough, better is the enemy of good. You saw in this all the presentation, this all the cases presented to with the respiratory symptoms, they maintain the saturation with 100 percentage. Right? They targeted 100 percentage. Don't go for 100 percentage if you are suspecting or uh, suspecting underlying congenital heart disease or. Uh, considering left to right shot. Why? Oxygen is very killer. Always around 90, 92 is enough during the acute phase. Right? These are the um, take home messages. If there are, is there any question, you can ask the question. Uh, since there is no questions from the audience, yeah. uh, I would like to uh, conclude the session. So today's session was conducted by Dr. Gajelan Sundar Raja.
consultant pediatric intensivist uh, teaching hospital in Radhapura. And also he is a long standing of a colleague and he worked uh, at um, LRH. And he was in the uh, experience in the field of pediatrics uh, for a long time. And also a very skillful uh, consultant uh, whom everyone would like to work. And thank you very much, uh, sir, for your kind presentation and very elaborative lecture and uh, uh, in the field of uh, pediatric intensive care. Once again, um, we uh, invite all the participants to uh, join our next session on uh, 24th March, uh, 9.30 a.m. for another wonderful uh, Sri CPD webinar session. Thank you very much.